Well, we do want to say a word of welcome to everyone today and glad that you are here and glad that we can worship the Lord together. And it is uh, it's always a delight to be in the company of God's people. This is a family reunion, what we have going on here. And the first of the month, of course, we're going to celebrate our, our fellowship dinner together. And fellowship dinner is is just one of the high points we have. It, it is an opportunity for us to completely do what the, the first church did. They broke bread together and uh, they did this on a regular occurrence. They, they ate together. And so this is a delight for us to be able to do that. Uh, they sang hymns, they prayed, uh, they worshiped and they broke bread together and they shared the, the ministry of the word. And so this is a, this is going to be a complete day. And so we, uh, we, Glad that you're here to share with us, and uh, welcome back. We have, there's Barbara we haven't seen in a, in a few weeks, so we're glad to have you today. Uh, and we know that Rosa is back home, uh, not, not quite up to making it, making it out of the house yet, but we're so glad that she's back home, and uh, we're anxious to, anxious to see her again. And so, we have, we have a lot of great things happening, and a lot of praise than things that we want to give God the praise for. And um, also, happy uh, occurrence, we get to the, the part of our story where we're talking about a meal on the day we're going to go share a meal together. So uh, what we're looking at today is, what is for dinner? And you will see this is not a question. Okay? This is not a question. Usually that's a question that's common in our house anyway. We come in, what's for dinner? And uh, I understand mothers really love being asked that every single day of their life, right? They just, uh, they, they enjoy that question, don't they? Um, by the way, what's for dinner? <laughs> but uh, anyway, this one is not a question. This one is a statement, okay? Kind of Abbott and Costello-esque, if you would, because... Here we are, our catch up with our story is the period of testing happens between when Israel leaves Egypt and when they get to the mountain where they are going to receive the Ten Commandments. And the entire trip down there between Israel and the, and the mountain, God is testing them. God is trying to see what they're made of. And testing them in different ways, different aspects. And so we come across the third test today in the 16th chapter of, of Exodus. It has now been into the second month since they left. Okay, second within the second month here. So less than 60 days, sometime during the second month, it says they departed from Elam and they came to the wilderness of Sheen, and which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month, after they had left the land of Egypt, the entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, that we sat by the pots of meat and ate all the bread that we wanted. Instead, you brought us into this wilderness to, uh, to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Wow, this is, uh, so here's the story. It's less than two months. And of course, you know, they packed food with them, but they've ran out. They were able to get a little bit more at Elam when they had all those palms and the date palms and gathered some more snacks for the trip. But now all the food stores have run out. Nothing left in the pockets and they're hungry again. Now, wouldn't it be great if we had been able to report to you that the Israelites came up and said, Moses and Aaron, will you please plead with God for us because we don't have any food? We know that God can take care of us. We know that God has wiped out the Israelite, the Egyptian army. We know that God took care of the Red Sea problem and he just stacked up the water and then he gave us food and he gave us water. And then he, he had all the Israelites, just Egyptians, just give us money for the trip. And we know that God takes care of us in so many wonderful ways. And he, he made that water sweet just a few weeks ago. And, and we know that God can do anything. So please ask him to give us some food. Wouldn't it have been great if they had, uh, if we had been able to say that, if their story had read like that? That's not what they did, is it? 
They came up to Moses and said, ah, we're hungry and it's all your fault. It's all your fault. They, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron saying, you brought us out here to die of starvation. Now, have you ever heard that phrase, hindsight is 2020? Right. And we've also heard the phrase people talk about the good old days. And when we remember backwards in time, there is something weird that happens with our memories. There's bad stuff and good stuff. And our brain just takes an eraser, magic eraser, and scratches out all the bad stuff. And we think that uh, somehow everything was much, much better then. Okay. And... We just think about the good old days. Every generation has the good old days and they're always past. And we forget that they weren't that good. Okay? Look what they thought about their life in Egypt. We used to sit by pots of meat and eat all that we wanted. No, you didn't. Did you forget that you were slaves? Did you forget that you had 16-hour work days? Did you forget all that stuff? You didn't just get to sit around and cook and eat. That's not what your life was. I just forgot all of that. And talk about short-term memory. How long ago was it? That's less than two months. Okay? I mean, for us, we say 2020 hindsight. 2020 was two months ago. So you think that's not that long. And they have already glorified their past experience to where it was a wonderful time sitting around eating all they wanted. Well, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. The people are going to go out each day. They're going to gather enough for that day. And this way, I'm going to test them to see if they will follow instructions. Okay. Very clearly, God says that the answer to their grumbling is going to be a test. He intends to test them. Now, episode after episode here reminds us that God gives tests to his people. God tests us. God does not tempt us, but he does test us. Okay? Because a temptation is what Satan does to lure us into doing something wrong. A test is what God gives us to see if we're going to do something right. Okay? There's a big difference, and the biggest difference is in the motive. Okay? And just like, just like uh, as is God's nature, we have the ability to pass this test. The Egyptians had the ability to pass this test. If instead of remembering wrong, the, the life in Egypt, if they had instead remembered how God took care of all those is Egyptian gods, how God took care of the, of the Red Sea, how God took care of the army, how God took care of the, the bitter water, if they had remembered all that stuff, instead, they would have been able to pass this test. Okay? So here is, here is their test. God is going to use this manna, this, this bread from heaven, to teach people that he is the provider. Okay? That's the main lesson that he wants to teach. See, when God gives a test, it's always part of the lesson. When God tests us, it's for us to learn something. Okay, We're supposed to pass the test, and we're supposed to understand more about God in the time. So God is giving this test and he's teaching them that he is the provider. Matter of fact, that's one of the names of God, isn't it? God, my provider. Yes. Okay. Abraham realized that God was the provider when he was given the charge to take Isaac and put him for sacrifice. And he said, God's going to provide. God's going to provide. He had no idea how. But he knew God would provide, and he kept telling Isaac that. God will provide. And on the way up there, he had to tell him over and over again, Isaac's down on the sacrifice, ready to get 
sacrificed and the arm is raised with the knife and God stops his arm, Abraham's arm, and shows him the ram caught in the bushes. Yes. God is the provider and Abraham knew it at that minute and he called him Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. I'm going to see how God is going to take care of this. I'm going to see how God intends to provide. Well, they, he said they're going to gather it and they're going to follow my instructions and there's going to be twice as much on one of these days and everybody's going to know what it is. And so here it is. He comes and tells them, Moses and Aaron comes and tells them everything that's going to happen. And he says, I've heard the complaints of the Israelites. And he said, at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you will eat bread until you're full. Then you'll know that I am the Lord, that Yahweh is your God. So we're down in verse 13 now. Quail came and covered the camp. In the morning there was a layer of dew. When the layer of dew evaporated, there were fine flakes on the desert surface and as fine as the frost on the ground. And the Israelites saw it and they asked one another, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. The word in, in Hebrew is manna. Okay? Manna means what is it? Okay? So you see, it's not a question. What is for dinner? Okay? They look around and say, what is it? I don't know. What? We'll just call it what. So here they go. What? They don't know what, what it is, and so they call it what? What is it? Okay. Like I said, shades of Abbott and Costello. Who's on first? Yes, he is. Well, what is for dinner? They didn't know what it was. And so they decided they're going to uh, just call it what? Well, we have tried to figure out, scientists and, and smart people through the years, what it was. The Israelites didn't know. They called it what, it, what is it? But we've tried to say, well, maybe we're smarter than, the, than those guys. Maybe we can figure it out. And so they read the description and they've come up with a lot of different, a lot of different options for what actually this thing was. They're trying to find out something that's still there now that they can see, that they can relate it to, so they can say, that's what it was. It must be this thing that you can still find over there. That is a futile effort because what they're basically trying to do is to try to find another explanation for this besides God's miracles. Okay? This is just another, op another way that people are trying to take a miracle out of the Bible and explain it away so that it doesn't have to be miraculous. It's futile. It's worthless. Because even if, even if it was a naturally occurring thing that still happens, that you could go over there and still find, even if that were the case, it would still be a miracle because it happened exactly when God told it to. And it stopped exactly when God told it to. And it got twice as much on one day and none the next day exactly as God told it to. So the timing is still a miracle, even if it was something that was a natural occurring substance. It was not, by the way. We'll never figure it out because the day that they walked into the promised land, that day, it stopped just like that. It started like that and it stopped just like that. But you see the quail, the quail was a naturally occurring thing. There still are quail. We have them on our property here. Quails still exist. So that was a natural thing that God used miraculously at a point in time for them. And the manna was something totally unnatural that God used in a miraculous way to feed his people exactly on time. Well, so we don't know what it is. We can't figure out what it is. Scientists can't go and observe things and come up with the answer of what happened in the wilderness to feed, the, to feed these guys. 
So let's think about what we do know. We do know some things about this manna. We know that every single morning you could just go out and get it. It was free. It was fresh every morning. It came every day except the Sabbath. Except Saturdays. None happened on Saturdays. Well, how is how if nature was a thing besides God, which it isn't, how would it know when which day is a Saturday? It wouldn't. Okay? Doesn't make any sense. Okay? So we know that happened every day, and it was fresh and, and every day. Do you know something else that is new every morning? According to the book of Lamentations, God's mercy is new every morning. Isn't that wonderful? God's mercy is new every morning, just like the manna, new and fresh every morning. Another thing we know about the manna is it had everything that you needed to stay alive. It was, it was the perfect food. You talk about superfoods that are nutrient dense these days. We get a lot of those in organic foods and tons of antioxidants and all these vitamins and they, they measure how many, how much uh, percentage of these vitamins and minerals you need and how this fruit or that food could satisfy more of that. Manna, if they had a package on the back with all the nutrition facts, it would say, you need this, 100%. You need this, 100%. You need iron, minerals, vitamins of this, vitamins of that, the whole alphabet, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%. That's what the food label would say because it had everything they needed to sustain them, to sustain their life. Now that is an amazing food. That is totally miraculous. There is no naturally occurring substance that can do that. None. Only bread from heaven could do that. So it had all the nutrients they needed. Here's another thing we know about the manna. It was plentiful. They got up and they were able to take as much as they needed. Nobody went hungry. They could go out and if you wanted more, you'd just pick it up. And they could eat all they wanted. It was like it was a buffet every day. All, all you could eat, you could never go hungry eating the manna because it was exactly how much you need and it was totally, totally enough. If you eat a lot, if you eat a little, there was enough. There was always enough. So that's another thing we know about. It. Here's, a, here's a great thing. Um, manna is free. <laughs> how about that? We like free. This is free food. Okay. Imagine going through the cafeteria, getting to the line, or getting to the end of the, of the checkout. You push your card up there, and they, they ring it all up, and uh, your total is zero. Woo! That'd be awesome! Zero. I don't even have to pull out my wallet. It's all free. I've got a coupon that says, get as much as you want. It's on me. God. Okay? That is, that is the greatest thing about man. It, it had everything you need, and it was plentiful, plentiful, and it was free. And not only was it free, this is how good God is. God could have, God could have made it totally all they needed, totally free and fresh every morning. He could have made it bland, but he made it delicious. He made it taste wonderful. Okay? Something that we, we can't even imagine, these spices and, uh, and sweet like, a, like honey and coriander seed and things that are like it. It was a delicious meal. It's kind of like having dessert wrapped up in it. And after all of that, the people were still saying, well, it's, we don't know what it is, but we're going to have it. So God said they're going to gather this and they're going to take it into the tent and there's not going to be any surplus because no one, verse 19, is allowed to let any of it remain until the morning. But you know what? Some of them didn't. Some of them didn't. Okay? 
So, what does this teach us? First of all, it teaches us that God is our provider. Now, though, now we're getting into the, to the ultimate lesson, the, the more full lesson, which is God is using the manna to teach us about Sabbath. Okay? Teach us, teaching us about the Sabbath. He's going to teach them about the Sabbath. And that was that, uh, first of all, it's a check on listening. Remember what he said in verse 4? I'm going to see if they're going to follow my instructions. All right? This has not been only one teacher that did this. There have been many teachers through the years that would give an assignment like this. They would give the class the assignment. Number one, read all the instructions before completing assignment. Number two, read this entire article in its, and read everything in this article and notice all the details that you can. Number three, summarize the article in a single topic sentence of less than 20 words. Number four, cite all the references that are used by the author. Number five, draw a picture representing the main idea. And number six, put your name on your paper and turn it in without doing any of these things. That's kind of a trick. And there's been a lot of teachers that do things like that through the years. And if you've had, you may have had some teachers, you may have had that kind of assignment. And you'll see some people that don't follow instructions furiously start writing and drawing and studying and reading. And then some people that read that first thing got all the way to the end, put their pencil down. And you realize those are the ones that were listening. This is a test to see if you're going to listen. And sure enough, he tells them, make sure that you only get enough for today and don't let any of it stay over till morning. Because the Sabbath is a check on our listening. The Sabbath is also a check on our greediness and our covetousness. All right? Imagine this guy. He goes and he sees all that free food laying it around and they didn't listen to Moses and he thinks, whoo, free food. And he just loads up his arms and he loads up his satchel and he, and he pulls his shirt up and just fills it up and he goes inside and, and keeps it, puts it in a Tupperware and uh, says, I'll have this for later. And then he gets up in the morning and he calls the kids together. All right, kids, it's time for breakfast. Opens up that Tupperware and what happens? The tent stinks. Oh, it's foul. It reeks. You say, oh, Dad, what was in that? And he looks in there and then flies start coming out all over the place. The thing is, God said, don't try to keep it until morning. It's going to turn rotten by morning. Yes. You can have it for day, today, but you can't keep any of it until tomorrow. You can't get more than, than you need for today. That is a check on our greediness and our covetousness. The Sabbath is such a check. Okay? Because you could think, wow, if I was working all day today, I could make this much amount of money. Why is it that God wants to rob me of this much money? I'm just going to go out and work this day too. I'm going to work every day. I'm going to work and get all the money I can every single day that I'm alive. And yet God wants to hold that in check by telling us you need a Sabbath. It's a check on our covetousness. It's a check on our greed. And so in this regard, there are two of the top ten commandments that are wrapped up in here. The Sabbath becomes one of the ten commandments. Covetousness becomes one of the Ten Commandments. And they work together. See? They are, they are connected in this way. And it's a check on our greed right there. The Sabbath is also a test of faith. Alright? So, are you going to depend upon God to be your provider? Are you going to depend upon God to take care of you? The fact that we take a day off to think about God, to pursue God, and to worship God, that is an indication that we're letting God take care of us this day. 
that he is going to be our provider. Now, this was a lesson they had to learn. Because you remember their life up until this point, it had been slavery. It had been a 16-hour workday every day, seven days a week. We don't close. Okay? This was their life. They never had a day off. These adults had grown up in slavery, never a day off. No holidays, no Christmas, no Easter, no President's Day, no Columbus Day, no St. Patrick's Day, no weekends. Always get up, go to work. And so God is training them that this is a special day. This is a day where you exercise faith in God that he is going to take care of you. Okay? This is why it is so important, so vitally important for us to pray like Jesus showed us. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay? If I could gather up today's daily bread and daily bread for all the rest of the next week, you know what I'd be able to say? Oh, well, guess what? I don't have to have faith tomorrow because I've got extra bread. I don't have to have faith for the next week because I got it covered. But God wants us to have that kind of faith every single day, every day, to be able to say, give us this day our daily bread. That's the faith that God wants us to have. That's what he was teaching them. And if they didn't believe it, they would go out on that Sabbath day trying to gather more, and there wouldn't be any. Okay? And that happened too. They had to learn on Friday, I need to back, pack up for two days because the Sabbath is a special day and there won't be any gathering. Okay? Now on that day, miraculously, the Tupperware worked. And they were able to store two days on Fridays. None of the other days it would do that, but on Friday you could get two days worth because Saturday, the Sabbath, you didn't gather. And they took that day off. And the Sabbath, the last thing that we need to learn about the Sabbath is, the Sabbath is a gift. The Sabbath is a gift for them. Because like I said, they had been all of their life without a day off and God is teaching them that we need rest. We all need rest. We need to be able to put that into the rhythm of life. And this is not a new lesson here. He's just reiterating it. Because the lesson of rest, the lesson of Sabbath, actually goes all the way back to creation. Week one of the universe. That's when it started. When God decided this is a day of rest. God wasn't tired. God could have kept going. Plenty of energy in the Godhead. But he instituted a day of rest for our sake to give us the example and the lesson that we need time to rest and we need time for the pursuit of God. We have to take time to go after God. Now, how is this a gospel connection? How is this a Jesus connection? Well, it tells us that Jesus has actually become our Sabbath. How? Because he said in John 6, I'm the bread of life. He said that right after he fed people out in the wilderness. Okay? He showed them that he could give them food in the wilderness the same way that God had done through Moses all those years ago. And Jesus said, it's actually me. I am the bread of life. And he is the fulfillment of the Sabbath day. So we don't need to be legalistic and we don't need to start making rules about how far you can travel and what sort of things are, are allowed. But we have to make sure we have, a, have it in place. Time for us to rest. Time for us to pursue God. And time for us to have that relationship with Jesus. Because when we pursue God, we develop that relationship with Christ. That's our Sabbath. Are we going to be willing to let God our be our provider? Are we going to 
give him the, the honor due him as our provider, as our faith, as the rock of our faith? Are we going to let Jesus be our Sabbath? That's what we need to do instead of being the grumblers. They needed to remember this. Now, here's the last miracle about the manna. Every day you pick up extra, it'll go bad in one day, except on Fridays. You could pick up two days worth on that day so you could have some for, for the Sabbath. And yet, not a, not a hermetically sealed container, later they took some Sabbath and they put it into the Ark of the Covenant. And it stayed for 40 years. That way they can always remember Jehovah Jireh, God is my provider. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so grateful to you for loving us and providing for us all that we need, our daily bread. Day after day, we know that you take care of us. Give us the faith to pursue you today and to enjoy your blessings on a daily basis. In your name we pray. Amen.